Today on Rambling About Cars, Subaru is going off-road with Wilderness. Subaru and Toyota have a partnership that's a little strange, and Volkswagen, oh, what the hell, man? Friends, yeah. ladies and gentlemen around the world, stalwart seekers of truth, I had to stretch for that one a little bit, and speed, it's podcast time. I'm Christopher Smith. Across the way is Bruce, Chris Bruce. It's just you and I today, man, and maybe yep. that's for the better because we have we have some stuff to talk about. Yeah, I think was it our very first episode we did what were you thinking? I think we talked yes. about BMW. We talked well, about BMW. This, this segment is being revived with what were you thinking? And this time we're talking about Volkswagen. And you, you want to jump right into Volkswagen? Yeah, I want to talk Volkswagen. I got, let's, I got feelings. <laughs> um, let's let's so, jump right into Volkswagen. Uh, I, I, so our boss, Brandon Turkus, he put up an op-ed about that today. We're recording Wednesday, just for clarity. Um, but I wrote the two stories previous to that, the two news stories about it. So I might as well go ahead and present it to you. Yeah, so, let's let's start start from the beginning. So yeah, everybody is totally. totally in the know here what's going on. Yep. Yeah. So kind of late afternoon, early evening on Monday, I think think i want to say we saw it on reuters first or it might have been usa today i know they both put up stories about it i'm just i can't quite remember which one we saw first um they put up a report claiming that volkswagen was going to put out a release the following day that they were changing their name to volkswagen right? and to be with clear v-o-l-t-s like the electric idea rather than v-o-l-k-s like the german word folk um, and yeah, it seemed pretty unbelievable. Like I said, I wrote the story. I gave reasons, you know, kind of for and against at that point in time, it wasn't clear. Um, apparently the release had gone up on Volkswagen's media site briefly, but was then taken down and a few sites caught it. Um, even before we, you know, I never saw that specific one. I was just going mm -hmm. by what other folks were saying. Um, Brandon, who, like I said, wrote the op-ed, he reached out to Volkswagen while I was writing the story because we wanted to get up quickly, get the story up quickly. And they gave him a no comment on the record. And what I came to find out later, he didn't tell me at the time, off the record, someone there told him that the story was true. Um, and, and that's a big deal. And we should also clarify, this is leading up to April Fool's. And in, well, in, the, in the auto industry, we see all kinds of stuff happen, weird stuff happen around this time. That's usually April Fool's. OK. And this certainly had earmarks to that, though, Bruce. And, and you did. But also it came March 29th. So it, it came it came early. And the fact that, OK, off the record, hey, this is real. And the fact that the people reporting it are USA Today and Reuters. Yeah. This is not, you know, enthusiast and they, and they press were, type and thing. And they were told the same thing, too, from what Correct. I understand. Yes. And, and, and that's where this really kind of differs from the normal April Fool's gag. So, right. so please, please continue. So that is – a story went up at 417 Monday. So following day then comes around. Um, and that morning, Volkswagen puts up a press release – officially saying that Volkswagen of America, it should be clear, not Volkswagen Group, Volkswagen World, Volkswagen of America right. would become Volf. I can't even. <laughs> Volkswagen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and it, yeah. And it was a very, very official looking press release. And unfortunately, they have taken it off of their press page now. You can Imagine no longer that. get it. And I, in preparing for the show, was not able to find it. So we're going to be looking at the story that I wrote that does have some quotes in it, but unfortunately, it's not the whole thing. And so it doesn't it doesn't just have some quotes like a spokesperson. No, it has <laughs> the president of Volkswagen of America giving quite a lengthy quote. And I actually included his lengthy quote. So I, I we're here. I might as well read it to you. Yes, yes. Re read it out because this is this is all important. I imagine there's people out there saying, OK, you know, what the heck? We know now it was a prank. Right. There's there's so much more behind this that and is just uh, tragic. Again, it, it's it worth really pointing out this came out March 30th. So, so we're, as we're still not in April Fool's. now, we are in March 31st. April Fool's has not happened yet. Um. So, yeah, so this is Scott Coe, president and CEO of Volkswagen of America. And he said, 
We might be changing our K for a T, but what we aren't changing is this brand's commitment to making best-in-class vehicles for drivers and people everywhere. The idea of a people's car is the very fabric fabric of our being. We have said from the beginning of our shift to an electric future that we will build EVs for the millions, not for the millionaires. This name change signifies a nod to our past as the people's car and a firm belief in our future in being the people's electric car. I mean, now, if this came on April 1st and we contacted reps okay okay it, it it's it's april 1st it's april fools you know it, this this is this is a joke right almost every time they would say well i mean yeah it's yeah it, it, it's a joke they they they're, they're not generally in the business of completely lying. complete okay yeah th- that's there yeah, there you go they they're not generally in the business of just completely lying And I I want to make one other very important point that a lot of people in looking at the aftermath of this now have been skipping over. And that is, A, this is a release that came out on March 30th. And B, it specifically said in that release that the name change would be happening in May 2021. So that means there is no mention in this entire release of the month of April. Right. As a way to indicate, oh, maybe this is an April Fool's joke. And and usually... There's some sort of wink, wink, nudge, nudge in right. all of these that we get for years. That's that's kind of been the thing. And, so you know, sometimes they're pretty imaginative. Sometimes they're pretty good. Sometimes it's just like uh, you're kind of reaching. But there's always, always been that sort of wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Yeah. So and uh, sorry, it, it just it's bothered me. So I got to throw this other and in there. They also were very careful about the wording in their press release. I really wish I could show you people the original, yep. but they said that their future EVs, the ID4 and going forward would have a Volkswagen badge on them with the T their internal combustion engines, the GTI, the Tiguan everything else would continue to have the traditional VW emblem on it. So that also makes sense. That kind of, you know, that kind of squares the circle. You get people, their vast range of current um, combustion engines. They have a VW emblem on it. Their new EVs, they have this Volkswagen on it. That, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of sense that makes it. Yeah. And yeah, so no, no real reason to, to not believe that considering everything that we've gotten thus far. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, we were, I reported the story. We reported the story. Um, and um, then and, and to, and to be clear, everybody reported the story. I mean, more yeah. one, I mean, I mean, we have a good reputation, but we're talking about USA Today. Um, I, I think didn't Reuters have a regular story out? Reuters did have a story about it. I mean, everybody did. It yes, was yeah. My and wife brought it up to me. Everybody was like, "Wow, they're really doing this." And then, <laughs> <laughs> so and then? that evening, um, there started to be rumblings. I want to say again, Reuters was really the ones that were on top of that. I, I, I think it was Reuters, if I remember. Um, they were the ones that first published a story saying that they had several insiders saying that this was an April Fool's joke. Um, we didn't publish on that. We discussed it, but until it was official, we weren't entirely clear because we had, like I said, we had this press release from Volkswagen saying that they were changing it. There was no, there was no official sign that we could see that they weren't. So we kind of hedged our bets. And then this morning, and again, we're on March 31st, they did finally put out this kind of mealy mouth tweet that, oh, it was a whole April fool's day joke. And but but yeah. didn't they? But still, didn't they not just come right out and say, "Oh, hey, April Fools"? It, 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 no, the tweet did say it was April Fools, but it also didn't quite admit that everything that had happened over the past few days, at past two days, was an April Fools' joke. It was. That's why I kind of called it mealy mouth. Like it kind of took credit for what was going on, but yet it also. It wasn't just a straight up, oh, we, me a culpa, we really screwed up this time, uh-huh. guys. So, yeah. Um, well, well, here, let's, let, let's take a look at the tweet. Let me see, let me see if I can get this tweet up here. Because, because yeah, I, mean, I, I think I was struggling to find it. Um, I think, I think really, this is important too. Let me, yeah, uh, if you can share it, please. 
yeah, let me get this pulled up here because when I first saw the tweet, like you, like we said last night, okay, we have to go by the official information that we have here. And it's, it's still just not completely clear. You know, I really think it's not completely clear in their tweet. I'm still trying to pull it up here. Okay, I'm ha- looks like I'm having a little bit of trouble pulling it up here as so well. So I we're we're recording this live, folks, and I put embedded in the story, and it the embed doesn't appear to be there. So it's possible the tweet that we had posted has now been taken down. <laughs> I um, know, right? I, I, I again, we I'm not 100 percent sure on that. I'm not alleging that, but kind of looks that way. Okay, um, okay. Well, no, I, I I I see the tweet here. Let me oh, okay, good. Okay, let me I see apologize. if I can get this. Shared. I apologize, VW. Okay. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, I, no, I'm, no, I'm not no going to make an allegation. It's not no true. Apologies. I just was looking and yeah. Well, StreamYard is being a little difficult for me. Let's see. Shoot me the link in private chat, and I will put it up then. No, I think I, I think I got it here. Is oh, that? Cool. Uh, nope, that's the that's the wrong box. Wow. Okay. Um. Well, let's give this another shot. In the in the meantime, it's it's important to I think to tell people why we're upset about this because I'm sure there are a lot of listeners that are just like, oh, whatever. You got you got took by an April Fool's joke. It's not that it's, it's not that at all. Bruce, uh, do you, can you offer a little bit of, of insight here as to why that's really not the case this time around? Well, here, hold on one second for me. I've got the tweet up right here. Oh, you've got um, it. Okay. There yeah, we go. Yeah. Um, so give me one second and I will share that. Um, and <laughs> to me, it's kind of a twofold thing, um, but let's, let's show people. Um, I'll go ahead and read this out for anyone who's listening to our audio version. What began as an April Fool's effort, you'll notice effort, not joke, not prank, not anyway, (laughs) to get the whole world buzzing. Turns out people are as passionate about our heritage as they are about our electric future. So whether it's Volkswagen or Volkswagen, T with the first one, K with the second one, people talking about electric driving and our 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 ID for can only be a good thing. And then the image to go along with that is an electrical plug with Watt, W-A-T-T, like the electrical idea happened um, below it. Now, okay, that that's, that's fairly obvious. They're still a little vague as to whether or not they might use a Volkswagen in the future. And I, I wouldn't be surprised to learn later on that they're kind of testing the waters here. But what's interesting to me is the first comment, the first re- the, re- the reply to this tweet underneath from, what is it, U.S. citizen Sam Bain, okay? The, this reply says, that's cute, but with this campaign, I'm just thinking about how VW was founded by Nazis, they cheated on EPA mileage ratings, and now gaslighting that we're confused rather than admitting they screwed up on their marketing. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's... This this is this is what so, makes it so difficult from from our perspective because especially so, especially now just with all of the misinformation and fake news that gets thrown around it's it's such it's such a difficult time right now for everybody and to have an automaker taking something like this and I mean, really lying. I mean, this this to me, this this goes beyond a little bit of a joke. The way they rolled it out, the way they tried to back it up, the way they continued to present it, uh, not good form, Volkswagen, not good form at all. It was an interesting idea. F for execution. F, a major, big, flat out F. And here, so I think it's the issue is twofold, personally, um, that you know, Volkswagen lying to the press is bad. There's kind of this tenuous relationship between PR and journalists where I, I've always referred to it as the game where there's information that PR has that journalists wants. And there's information that PR wants to get out that they need the help of journalists to get. And there's a push and pull there where a lot of times maybe you get a little thing that the company didn't want to let out yet in response to putting out the information that the company does want to get out. And there's that kind of push pull and you're not supposed to lie. Like um, I covered the VW Dieselgate thing. I talked to VW PR a lot in 
ever, you know, there might have been cases where they were massaging things to make them sound better, or I would ask a question and they would decide not to respond. And both of those are completely okay. And that's just, that's the game. But straight out lying to not only us, but also umpteen other sources. Yeah. That's just bad. Like that's not because that ruins the trust. Like that means if I ask you a question in the future and you tell me something, there's this little niggling thought in the back of my mind. Are you telling me the truth? Mm -hmm. That's the one side of it. The other side of it. And the part that bothers me more probably because I, I kind of have a stake in this game since I wrote the two posts about it is the allegations from our commenters that, we shouldn't have we should have never believed it that this, this was obviously an april fools joke and you know it's our fault for being taken in on it no you're and, you're not wrong there it's a, it's a double edged sword we're doing what we're supposed to do and, and my response to that though is that so we start out with these rumors that we report on and not only are they rumors, my boss talks to VW and gets an on comment or gets a no comment on the record and off the record that this is true. And obviously, I didn't report this is true because off I didn't actually know. Yeah, I didn't know about the off the record part yep. because it was off the record. But, you know, so there. But had he said it wasn't true, my boss, I am 99 percent sure would have come to me and said, temper this to make it look like, you know. Yeah, and and, this a little. And, and to be clear, that happens a lot in situations like this. When an automaker yeah. wants to wants to, I mean, it, it's a it's a give and take. Hey, we want to have an interesting story out. It's April Fool's. People are going to be looking for fun, interesting April Fool's stuff. I honestly, at this point, I don't know if we're going to have anything. We haven't really seen anything from automakers this year, no, uh, aside no, from Volkswagen. I, I think last, I'm scared people off. <laughs> I know, right? And I mean, last year with COVID, everybody was just like. Uh, Times are times are just really sketchy right now. Now is not the time to to try to do something like this. Um, but th there is, I mean, we do feel legitimately violated here um, from from a from an automaker journalist perspective and it, in, the, just, in, the, in I, the trust department. And exactly, I, I, but the part that bothers me is people thinking that I don't take my job seriously, and I took whatever an automaker put out, no matter how, like, even if you read the first story I put out, I put out all of these reasons why this seems weird, but maybe oh, yeah. there's some way that this could be true. Like, well, I mean, and and how many people read the story though? I mean, I, I hate to say I, it. I, I, I mean, let me come up folks. We want to have your comments. We want to have your feedback, but at least give us the respect to read the story before you go jumping in. Um, because you, you had all kinds of great points. The biggest one and, I don't I'm, I don't think anybody else really picked up on this. You are very, very good at searching uh, for official patents trademarks, trademarks yeah. for official patents. And if you're going to do a name change like this, there's going to be there's going to be a, a trademark file somewhere for it. And you didn't find a single thing for Volkswagen. And for me, that was pretty much a nail in the coffin right there. OK, and uh, so that's definitely a red flag. The thing is, there is often several days and not like mm -hmm. like three, four, five days between submitting the paperwork and it going in right. the online system. So, so maybe they did it last doubt. week and, you know, but I can tell you for sure that it hadn't been done previous to that because there would have been a filing for it. Yeah. So, you know, it looked weird, but it's not necessarily like, you know, bells and sirens and stuff like that. It's just a red flag. And I mentioned the story, but yeah. Um, yeah, no, I mean, there's, there's reasonable doubts. And again, when we have a, an official word, even off the record as it was, if I remember correctly, there were many of our colleagues at other outlets that did have on the record. I don't think so. I believe every comment about it being untrue. Oh, no, sorry. They were anonymous, but on the record. So the person who was saying it was not identified. It was an anonymous source but it was on the record. So it kind of gets into a weird journalism thing that it's something, if it's not on the record, I can't mention it when I can't mention where it came from. Mm -hmm. If it's something can be on the record, but the source can ask to remain anonymous. And if I respect that source enough, then I can report on it. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what happened here where I don't know who those people were talking to, but they trusted them enough and these are people who have worked in the industry for quite a while that they've ran with the story. 
and that's where we are. So, and and I feel like we're dealing with a little bit of inside baseball. And and yeah. to be honest, to be honest, we are. So, why should you, the the general auto enthusiast, care about this? Um, my first response to that is. If we can't trust the sources we're talking to, it's difficult for us to tell you what you need to know, or more importantly, what you want to know about what an automaker is doing. And it sounds like we're blowing this up a little bit, but when you consider Volkswagen's recent history with the Dieselgate scandal, and in effect, what they're kind of doing here is once again, lying to promote their electrification. I mean, why do you need to lie to promote your electrification? If you wanted to do a neat April Fool's joke, we're changing the name to Volkswagen. You could have done it, Volkswagen. You could have done it without just just the undermining of the process. And the thing is, there's precedent for that. When I believe it's either the fifth or sixth generation Golf came out, uh, Wolfsburg, which is where Volkswagen Group's global headquarters are, they changed the name to Golfsburg for a week. Mm hmm. Yeah. And that's kind of the same thing as going from Volkswagen to Volkswagen. Like, oh, we're Volkswagen this week to promote our EVs. Like, okay, yeah, that's cool. That That's a neat way to get the message out there that we're serious about electricity. But, you know. So, so now in a month or two when they say – Hey guys, we're actually we've actually decided we're going to bring the standard golf back to the US. Are you? I I mean, seriously, are you? There are a lot of people in the United States that would like the regular golf. But are you are you being honest with us this time? Or are you just trying to drum up some more PR for the GTI or a Golf R? That, that's these these are the implications that we will be facing in the coming months. And when I say we, I'm talking about the entirety of automotive journalism here, not just motor one, the entirety of automotive journalism. If you look at, uh, if you look at Brandon's op-ed that he posted today, he has, he has Twitter links from so many people from various outlets all over the place, feeling the same way as we are. Okay. There is a level of trust here that's been violated. So the next time you have some big impressive announcements, how are we how are we going to present that to our readers? Right. The next that, time hey, there's hey, some maybe. leaked bit of VW news that's actually true, maybe. Are we even going to decide to report on it? Because last time it wasn't true. Yeah. And you know what? It, it was all centered around an April Fool's joke. Sometimes April Fool's jokes work sometimes it's not even April Fool's yet. <laughs> and it, yeah, we're talking about this now. I mean for for crying out loud, this has been going on for 3 days. It's March freaking 31st. It's not April Fool's Day yet. Um I mean I have to wonder if if this legitimately was botched and they realized okay, we we got to go ahead and say something. Okay, now it's really messed up. Now we got to go ahead and move everything up. You know I don't okay. know. I, I think Whew, I, I, don't I think know. we got to kill this, like because I could keep <laughs> going on this because it, there's just all sorts of. But let's let's switch to, as opposed to going inside baseball. Let's look at a product that just got announced this week. Um, that, and that would of, be that would be the Subaru Outback Wilderness. That would be the Subaru Outback Wilderness. Um, do you have that link or do you want me to share it? Uh, why don't you go ahead and share it? Okay, I've, I got I've, it right here. I've discovered that uh, that my idiot self actually set my browser up wrong, which is why I <laughs> okay. can't find anything to share. So, okay, uh, go ahead and set that up, and I'll I'll get the next one. I promise. No, 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 no. We're good. We're good. We're good. Um. So yeah, uh, we had seen spy shots of this before. We're looking at the Subaru Outback Wilderness, and so Wilderness is going to be Subaru's new sub brand for their especially um rugged models, and so we're getting the Outback first. Um, um, we published a rumor a few months, uh, two months or so ago, mm -hmm. um, that they're also going to a Forester version on the way. It's just automakers never kind of put both of these models out at the same time because right. they don't want them to step on each other's feet. So we're seeing the Outback now. I would bet in three months we'll see the Forester version. Um, and yeah, so you get uh, the latest Subaru Outback. It's got a slightly different front fascia. It's got a whole lot more body cladding. It's got a higher ride height. Um, same engine. Um, you get a front skid plate. Um, you get a uh, 
higher numerically, but quicker. You, you get a quicker final drive ratio. Um, so I'm very I'm curious about your opinions on that, because I wonder if you take the um, Yokohama Geolander tires off and you put kind of regular tires on whether it actually might be quicker than a Outback Turbo. Um, oh, and you get the trick kind of LED fog lights. Um, I got a good picture of them right here. I mean, I guess I guess the question is, um, I mean, I'm I'm intrigued by it. I love I, I love vehicles like this for for an off road purpose. Um, and I've always been a Subaru fan. The Outback has never been bad for what I guess would call mild off road. This car has nine point four inches of ground clearance, though. Mm -hmm. um, that's almost the same as a Jeep Wrangler. I mean, that's just a little bit less than a Jeep Wrangler. So that tells you a little bit about at least what it can get over. Now, um, its approach and departure angles, nowhere near anything like a, like a Jeep Wrangler. It's, um, it's like 20, 20, I think, 20 degrees approach, 23 departure. If if I'm not exact on that, I'm, I'm really close. So, I mean, it's... It's not bad, but I mean, it, it's 20 not approach, uh, 23.6 departure. Oh, okay. 23.6. Okay. Um, I don't think you're going to see these at Moab. I'd be honest. No. I'd like, I'd like to see one try. I would really like to see one try, but it, I mean, am I the only one that thinks, I mean, yes, it has, it doesn't have just like a regular street tire, but right. those tires still don't look appropriate for what I would consider an off-road branded vehicle. Uh, so he, I think that this was always going to be a compromise because you're right about the tire situation. The other thing, though, is that you're still running that through the CVT. And listeners, if I'm wrong, please tell me. But as far as I understand, you're never going to get a CVT to perform as much as a classic automatic or manual transmission with a transfer case to let you go, you know, kind of low range and stuff like that. It's just and never it, it, it's just not what a CVT does. And, um, and that would be that would be my big hang up on on using this for anything more than just going down some back roads or, or maybe some established two tracks, um, which is kind of tragic because. The Outback can already do that. So I don't I, I don't really understand the off road performance increase um, because this I, I think the CVT is going to hold it back some. Um, I mean, you're going to have a little more clearance, but I still don't see people doing anything more with this than they would do with a regular Outback. So in my mind, it's it's Subaru's take on maybe trying to open up to a, to a different group of buyer that might not be considering the Outback in the first place. And so it's interesting that you mentioned that because, so my wife and I, we have a 2012 Subaru Outback and it's dead stock. It's just, you know, other than switching out the tires, it's what it came from the, from the factory. And, but that being said, I follow the Subaru Outback subreddits and that's, there kind of seems to be two groups of people. One group is saying I can do almost all of this from the aftermarket already because there are skid plates, there are lift kits, mm -hmm. there obviously the wheel and tire packages. Pretty much other than that final drive ratio change, the aftermarket is already of, there to do this. The other group is kind of saying that what's nice about this is that it's all one package that you can already buy. So if you were thinking about buying an Outback and modifying it, then why not just get this and have it with a full warranty? Right. I guess the question is price, and Subaru hasn't told yeah, us that yet. Yeah, we don't know. Um, and, and I mean, Subaru also said that, hey, we have new suspension in there. They haven't told us details on that, which I find a little... Well, yeah, they only gave us ride height. They didn't just, give just, us... Just ride height. They said there's, there's something different with the suspension, but they didn't really say what. So, I mean, there's still right. a little bit more to learn about this car. Yeah, um, I think price is going to be the major thing because yeah. the other thing is Subaru already has the Onyx edition, which is kind of what this starts basically they take the onyx edition and add a bunch of stuff to it add a lot of these extra parts and so it's going to be interesting to see how much more than that model that they charge for this one um and that's i assume basically that's what's going to decide whether or not this is a success to me you know because if you could just go to the aftermarket and buy the parts then maybe someone's just going to do that instead we'll see i mean i don't mean to sound pessimistic because I like the idea of an off-road branded 
wagon. I mean, I, I like the idea of a wagon anyways, right? Sure. So I, I like where Subaru is going with this. Um, I, I wish they would go a little bit further, though. I, I, I mean, especially with the tires. I'm just looking at another picture of it now, um, especially with the tires. I would like to see. I mean, if you're going to brand it as an off road vehicle, I mean, let's uh, I mean, let's let's see it off road. You know, let's so, I, I, I mean, mean let, let's see it with a little more capability because the ride height. I mean, man, the ride height looks just awesome. <laughs> so I actually agree with you. I'm a. It's not that I'm dubious. I would put, I would say I'm on the fence. Like mm -hmm. this is a cool starting point. I, I want you to do more Subaru. Right. But, so like I said, we know a Forester version is on the way, but like, okay, let's just imagine a second. The Outback and the Forester sells great. What if we get like a WRX wilderness with a, you know, lifted suspension and stuff like that? Basically a rally spec uh, WRX. Like, uh, I mean, uh, yeah, a WRX that's that's actually more like rally spec than it already is. I, yeah, yeah that, that, that could be fun because, I mean, really, the WRX and, and the STIs right now, they, they have rally heritage. But when they come from the factory, I mean, they're, they're coming from the factory with the idea that you're still on the street or maybe some dirt roads. They're not they're not really ready to go out and take jumps. Not that people are jumping their STIs and WRXs anyways, right. cause I know that never happens. <laughs> um, but yeah, there's, I mean, well done Subaru for trying to, to tap a market that SUVs and trucks are really trying to dominate with wagons and eventually the, uh, the Forester crossover. Yeah. Now, I, I, now I, get, I, get a little gutsy and make it a little bit better. Yeah. I think this is a great first step. You know, it, it's I think it's kind of a tentative first step. You know, a lot of the parts, like I said, they're kind of if you don't mind going to the aftermarket, they're already there. But, you know, let's see if this works. You know, Toyota TRD, you know, they started small and then now it's a very, very established thing. You know, let them do this. Let's see if this is a success. Let's see if the Forester's a success. And maybe one day these kind of wilderness Subarus will be a cool thing. Do you think that's I'm, a fair assessment? I, th I think it's a very fair assessment. Um, I th the main thing holding me up is price. If yeah, if they, yeah, we don't know. If if they don't go ridiculous on the price, um, then it could be th then it could be a good thing. If they decide that this is going to be some sort of halo model, uh, well, talk here a second. I will tell you what an Onyx is, and then we'll or and I'll get, look up uh, Outback pricing, and then we will we can kind of do some head math and. Right. I mean, because, OK, so I've owned two Subarus, um, both first gen legacies, a big rally fan. Um, and I always love the first gen legacy. I always envision myself as Colin McRae, you know, in the early days. <laughs> um, so seeing Subaru take this wilderness step. OK, let's let's see where this can go. But I, I and Bruce, I, I don't mean to hurt your feelings. I'm not happy with the way the Outbacks look these days. Um, That's fine. My they're, wife they're, loves it. So. They're, <laughs> <laughs> happy wife, happy life. So we're good. I, I mean, <laughs> I mean, and and maybe maybe that's just a just a thing that's fairly relegated to me. I, I like the idea of wilderness being. It's just it's, it's not aggressive enough. Even even with the kind of the wonky styling on the Outback, it's still just not aggressive enough. And you know, it it makes me. Oh, what's the word? It makes me like ninety percent there, ten percent really wanting it to be so much more. And I mean, Subarus. I mean, they're they're not they're not crazy expensive, but so I, not, I have the price they're not here. So they're I'm, not necessarily the cheapest to, to jump into the, the, no. the thing that really sticks out to me is how well they hold their value on the used yeah. market. Um, because I'm, I'm just, I'm the type of person I'm not interested in going out and spending that much on a new car. I, I have no problem getting one a couple years old, but damn the way Subies hold their values, you just go get it new because it's not going to be much different when it's used. What, what do you have there for Outback pricing? Cause that so does, Outback Onyx. Okay. That? I'm sorry. I said, uh, I'm guessing it starts somewhere around 30. Uh, you're a touch low. Okay. <laughs> uh, well, no, actually. So a, an Outback Outback base with destination is 27,845. Mm -hmm. 
but that's with the naturally aspirated engine and stuff like that. The base level, which is the Onyx with the turbo, is 36195. Okay. And that's with destination. And and the Onyx also has the 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 special two mode drive system for, for like snow and mud. The X and mode, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, or, yeah, the X the X mode. Yeah. Um so 36. So do you and think this will be 40? Well, so a touring, which is the top level right now, is 4995. And I guess I don't know. Are they going to go big? Like I could see 42, you know, or are they going to try to like really sell these and do? Yeah. 40. So I, I think, think yeah, if, go ahead. If, if they could, if they could somehow brand this just under 40, I think, yeah. I think, it, I think it would be, I think it would be awesome. That would be, if, if they sit right around 40, eh, it'd be all right. If they try to shoot right, for right the moon, around 40, I think it's fine. Start when you start pushing 40 is going to be, I think if, it's if they start. try to shoot for the moon and then it's just going to be like, okay, I'm going to spend 50 grand on a Subaru. Yeah. How, how many other off-road need off-road vehicles or off-road capable vehicles can I buy for 50 grand? And the answer is a lot. Yeah. Totally. And even me, as much as I like, would Subaru, shock me. like 50, I, I, you know, you, you never know yeah. how, how many times have we been shocked? That's true. You know, when it comes to pricing these days, it's it's just it's kind of an insane roller coaster. I mean, we're in an age where people don't blink twice at 50 or 55 grand for an F-150 pickup drive. And, you know, that's that's probably a conversation for another podcast. Um, I know there are lots of opinions. Episode of the podcast. (laughs) Uh, 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 Yes. Yes. Another episode of the podcast. I know there are lots of opinions out there about pricing. Um, But you know what? Hey, we would like to hear from all of you on Subaru Wilderness do you think we're just completely crazy? Do you think um, it's just a stupid move from Subaru? Do you think, hey, I would like to get one of those? Um, and would you even pay 50 grand for one, right? So tell us what you think. Email is podcast at motorone.com. You can drop a link um, to our YouTube video that you'll see. You also will want to follow us on YouTube. You can follow us on Apple. You follow us on Spotify. You ready for a little bit of inter- intermission here, Bruce? Absolutely. Yeah. I just want to tell people. So from what we've kind of been told, there might have been a bit of a tech snafu last week. And mm-hmm. our last episode might, if you are a subscriber to MotorOne.com on YouTube, you might not have seen our last episode in your feed. And if you didn't see it there, that's a shame. Um, we interviewed Ted Ryan, who is an archivist from Ford. We talked all about Bronco history. Um, we got into some real, like we literally went from the very beginning to the 2004 concept. So other than the very modern, the one that's coming soon, we talked everything about Bronco and it was a really good discussion. And it's kind of a shame that YouTube's algorithm kind of ate it and didn't send it to the people who necessarily subscribe to us. So if, you know, if, if for whatever reason you didn't see it, go to motor one, I think we're motor one com on uh, YouTube is our channel name um, and check it out, please. Cause it was a really good one. And, and, you know, it was a really good one, but we also just had some epic photos. Oh yeah. There, there were, I mean, if, if you're kind of into, especially some of the older photos, it was all about classic Bronco. It wasn't about new Bronco. It was about no, classic Bronco. There was no new Bronco. Um, it if, was from beginning to 2004 concept. Like I said, if you're, if you're into some of those old photos, um, yeah, go, go check it out. There's the one we have the thumbnail. Um, it's just like a silhouetted shot of the Bronco with a man and a woman there. That's that alone is worth a click. So <laughs> definitely want to go back and check that one out. And yeah. And if you aren't interested in Bronco, tell us what you are in- interested in, because we're still campaigning for people to send in their cars send in your car stories. We we've we've got a few, but we want to have enough to dedicate an entire episode to MotorOne.com listeners, MotorOne.com fans, car fans. We want to dedicate an entire episode to your stories, the cars that you drive, the things that drive you in life, the things that make you passionate about cars. So once again, the email podcast, podcast at MotorOne.com. Motor <laughs> we did we did not practice that ahead of time, and it shows. Yeah. <laughs> it, it shows very much so but yeah uh, what smith was just saying though like i know there are people that want to brag about the car that they've been building for umpteen years or just since COVID started or whatever go ahead and send them to us you know brag yeah we'll take a look 
I don't care what it is. I, I'll probably be <laughs> impressed because I don't have anything in my garage to wrench on. So there you go. Yeah, I'm I'm on board with you. So yeah. let's uh let's continue the discussion though. Yeah, um, let's continue the discussion today, and let's stick with Subaru for a little while. Kind of, sorta, yeah. Subaru um, and somebody else. That that somebody else would be Toyota, it and of course be. Subaru and Toyota have had a relationship for a while, uh, primarily with the '86 and the BRZ. And of course, we have the new BRZ from Subaru that debuted uh, November, I believe. That sounds right. And we're patiently awaiting the 86. Um, but it was just a few days ago, I believe, that it's late we got last a, week. I, late, late last week. We got a, Thursday, but who knows anymore? We uh, we got a teaser from. Did, did it come from Toyota, Bruce, or did it come from Subaru? I thought I it came, it from, came Toyota. from the Toyota side. It, it, it came from the Toyota side, um, just saying, we love making cars with Subaru. April 5th, we're going to talk about something. Right. And so the thing is, we don't know what it is. And right. sometimes we say we don't know what it is, and we do know what it is. And because of embargoes and stuff, we have to lie to you. But <laughs> this time, we really don't know what it is. Um. I'm showing it now. It says, let's make ever better cars together. Uh, April 5th, 2021. And that's, that's kind of all we know. <laughs> now. I mean, here's, here's where it gets interesting because if you're watching on YouTube, uh, we have the article up here. There is a teaser photo of presumably a red hood on the left side with a Toyota badge and a blue hood on the right side with a Subaru badge. Um, or, assuming they're hoods because it kind of looks like, okay, there's a line for the hood and then maybe a front fascia. Um, the obvious answer is, okay, well, this is, this is going to be the Toyota 86, but is it? We've right. heard that the, the, the 86 isn't going to be out this soon. Uh, we've heard that Toyota actually wants to try to differentiate it more from the 80 or from the BRZ for performance. And if it is the Toyota 86, why is Subaru in this teaser? Right. I know, the thing I know is when the BRZ debuted, the Toyota wasn't there. So why would Subaru show up to the debut of the new, uh, I almost said FRS, uh, GT86, GT, whatever we want to call it these days. Um, so, yeah. Um, and I'm going to share a page here that this is, so this is a Google translate. So I, I will be very clear with you that it doesn't <laughs> all necessarily make sense, right? But this is their, um, their page promoting this. And in addition to debuting, um, some sort of no jointly developed vehicle, there is going to be a, um, I don't think it's necessarily an interview session, but just kind of, a um, execs are going to be talking about it on april 5th and the people that are going to be there sorry i got to scroll down um toyota Mo the president of gazoo racing which is toyota's performance division koji sato and um subaru's chief technology officer the general manager of technology and uh the general manager of technology for that's research institute tetsuro uh fujinuki is also going to be there so I'm glad you're reading that because man i couldn't pronounce those names uh, no problem um so yeah so we're, we're two tech people are going to be there and they're going to de be debuting this new model and so it's just it's interesting. And the the Gazoo racing part is the especially interesting part because yeah. it tells us that this is a performance vehicle. You know, if it, it's not just, you know, they're working on some entry level crossover together. It, it, so, it, so, I mean, that is evidence for 86, but we just have, we have so, so much other conflicting evidence for right. 86. I mean, I mean, yeah, this, this kind of has, us, has us baffled a little bit. I mean, one thing, um, that we know is coming is an electric crossover that, that both Toyota and Subaru are working on together. Right. That's true. That's definitely and, true. And if memory serves me correct, um, let me see if, let me see if I have my screen share fixed now. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll bring up you some of this here. Quick? If not, I got one to share. Um, because we have been talking about, um, both Subaru and Toyota's crossover, right? Mm-hmm. 
And I, I know our colleagues at Inside EVs have also been talking about it. And yeah, I've, I've got that coming up here right now. There it is. Yeah. And yeah, so we have Subaru confirms electric midsize SUV for Europe, 21 to 2025. So the timing is right. The, the, the timing is right. Now, it doesn't feel like a sporty vehicle necessarily is the thing. Well, and, and that's where the Gazoo Racing is kind of throwing us off because yeah. you wouldn't expect it. Uh, but at the same time, performance what, what, EVs are a thing now. Performance EVs are a thing. But what if they're announcing this jointly developed crossover while also talking about future performance vehicles? Yeah. An, an unknown at this point, future performance vehicle. Now we know that the, uh, the, the, the BRZ here is coming. We have we have the article or not not the BRZ. We know the uh, the the Subaru model is coming. No um, BRZ, also, right? Subaru BRZ. Yeah. I I also have the Toyota article here. Toyota teases electric SUV before its Shanghai Motor Show debut. That timing's right, given the, that the timing yeah. is is absolutely right because I think this is in early April, is it not? It should say. I mean, it says right it says right here in the article. Isn't it April twenty uh, first? La, 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 la. Debut April this year. I thought it was early April, but it, in any case, April as we're recording is tomorrow. So Shanghai Motor Show is April twenty first through twenty eighth. But so, still, you could yeah. do yeah. We know we know Toyota is going to be debuting this vehicle soon. So there's there's some considerable evidence there saying okay, this is what's going to happen. But the Gazoo Racing thing. I mean, I mean, what do you think, Bruce? Could there be a, a racing version of a performance EV crossover coming from Toyota and Subaru? It could be, or I've got another thing. So <laughs> this is a report from 2019. Um, and this comes from best car in Japan, which best car is, mm. they will publish just about any rumor that anyone even like vaguely comes up with. So you take best car with the biggest possible grain of salt you can find. Yeah. Sometimes they're right. Sometimes they're very wrong. They've said like an NSX type R, I think was supposed to debut like two years ago. So we have to take this with a grain of salt. But allegedly they are working together on. So the headline here says next gen WRX, but the report it, it kind of splits hairs that it could be a few different things that um, they could be working on something that the translation, and again, Best Car is a Japanese website. They have no English edition, so we are working mm -hmm. on machine translations. Um, but something that translates as super all-wheel drive, which just judging by the name, it sounds like some sophisticated all-wheel drive system, which Subaru would certainly know how to do, and that they could they could be collaborating on something like that. Mm -hmm. um, again, it's an old rumor, but it's a, certainly an interesting one, especially given the time frame of automotive development. If you think this was November of 2019, if you're going to start showing off a vehicle in April, you know, two years before then, maybe development started. You've got two years. That's four years plus a few months to get it on the road. That's in line with normal vehicle development. So maybe it, it really, it really is. It really is. Um, I know we had a pretty animated chat in our, just in our teams group uh, with all the motor one editors and writers, um, everything from performance luxury SUV yeah. to, to my, my choice, who wants to see this SVX come back? Let's let's see it. Let's see the SVX come back shared jointly with Toyota has, uh, I don't know, pick pick whatever Toyota model you want it to be. I don't care because I want my SVX back. And the thing is, that's not totally unreasonable. Um, Yeah. I mean, if you're making an all wheel drive sports coupe. Yeah. Um, I believe not familiar. We're looking I believe, at uh, somewhat. I, believe SVX, I apologize for that, but SVX <laughs> image now. I, I believe the S SVX was an all-wheel drive sport coupe. It was. It was a very quirky, very expensive all-wheel drive sports coupe that completely was, you know, failed. So you know, traditionally, automakers don't like to revisit their failures. But I think enough time has gone by, and the SVX does 
have something of a cult following. I know that because I'm part of that cult following. I haven't, I am part of that cult as well. I haven't bought one yet, but I've been close many times. Um, So uh, something that our coworker Adrian and I have discussed is that, so something you have to realize is that Toyota, I believe right now owns 20% of Subaru. Um, And what if, let's just say, what if Subaru has been helping Toyota on their hypercar project? Oh, Um, we know the vehicle that we're looking at now, we know is coming because Subaru is competing in the Le Mans hypercar class. And that class specifies that a production vehicle must happen. And so I hope anyone who's watching it here. So here we are looking at, you can see it's open top. It is, you know, it looks very sporty, but since that image has come out, we have also seen the racing version, which is this right Hold on, which is this right here. And you can see they are not identical vehicles. They, Mm. you know, obviously it's not open top. The fin going on the back isn't as large. There's no wing on the other one. So while they're, they certainly have their similarities. They're not, it's not just one for the other. What if Subaru has been contributing to the hypercar program? And that's what we're going to get to see. And the interesting thing about that is, is that the series in which the car we're looking at now starts racing, the first event is at the end of April. So an event in early April to show off the, you know, to show more stuff about it, it's not out of the realm of possibility. Oh, Bruce, what are we going to (laughs) do? But no, that's kind of the fun thing. Yeah. About this job sometimes is getting an announcement like this, knowing that something is coming clearly. And, you know, the easy money is it's going to be the new Toyota 86. That that's the easy money. That, that's that's the easy pickings, but but uh, there's, there's a lot of evidence that doesn't support it. Right. But there's, there's a also lot. a lot of evidence that doesn't support all of these other things. Other, yeah. Unfortunately, here's here's kind of a practical level that I keep coming back to. Um, automakers right now are selling SUVs and crossovers and a lot of automakers are pulling away from sedans and pulling away from, in some cases, pulling away from cars completely. So when you're looking at a, at a joint collaboration between two groups that already have a sports car they're doing together that we know for sure, my heart kind of tells me, well, my heart wants it to be a nice sporty coupe, an SVX revival, um, a hyper car or some sort of supercar like that. My brain tells me I, I still think it's I still think it's likely some sort of SUV. I think it's likely going to be um, at, at the very least, they're going to announce this new jointly developed electric crossover that may have a performance application in the future or. They'll announce the electric crossover and then say, hey, we're working on some other stuff later on with performance applications. That, that's that's kind of what my that's kind of what my logic sells tells me. And you're not wrong, but I just want to address the image that we're looking at now, which is a Subaru brat. And that just got as a joke, we threw it out in our chat that what if they're gonna make some sort of performance pickup? Um, it's just an excuse to share an image of a brat, to be honest with you. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. I, pr- I appreciate that. I appreciate that. It, there's never a bad time to show off a Subaru brat, especially one that's tan with black and orange trim. So I, I'm trying to put while we're sharing kind of dark horse candidates, um, there is a rumor going around that Lexus is developing a halo vehicle that is a body on frame SUV, which sounds really weird. It, it would be low production, high cost, you know, halo for them. And the one other thing that has kind of come up is that could Subaru somehow be helping with that vehicle? See, uh, I, I, I know the rumor. I would totally believe it for Toyota. I cannot see Subaru offering some sort of high end, very expensive SUV. I just can't that that collaboration just makes no sense to me at all. You know, you're right. It's it, it's fun to speculate, though. And that's kind of where we are now. We're in the fun speculation mood because we have what 
less than a week, certainly, as of recording right now. And by the time this goes up, even less than that before we'll actually know whatever it is that they're talking about. But, you know, it th- that's kind of what this segment was about. We're just having fun. Yeah. After after a little bit of venting on Volkswagen, it's time to have a little bit of fun. Honestly, I was having fun with the SVX. We could go back and talk about the SVX all day. I don't know why that car fascinates me so much, but no, I, I take that back. I do know why it fascinates me so much. It was a flat six. Right. It was Subaru, windows. It introduced Subaru's flat six. Yeah, it was. It was a flat six with windows that didn't go down all the way with yep. weird styling with all wheel drive. And you could also get them with front wheel drive, too, if I remember correctly. Yeah, but that was like the cheap version. That, yeah. that was that was the cheap version. And uh, I want to say these things are like 30 grand plus when they were new. Brand it new. Sound like much they now. With the front wheel drive models. But, but that they was needed a cheaper version to sell to people. because right. They weren't selling normally. And, and 25 years ago. Thirty thousand dollars was quite a bit for a car. It was oh, yeah. seriously, it was serious money for a Subaru, which in the U.S. at that point people still associated just with you know little small runabouts. So I guess that's why it fascinates me. I've never pulled the trigger just because I've I've never found one that I felt comfortable with. Um, so they tra- had that kind of transmission cabin. Yeah, thing. yeah, look at that. Um, but yeah, the transmission is famously they're made of glass. Um, I. As I understand it, there are people that can swap in manuals, but yeah, that they only ever came with an automatic, at least in the U.S. I don't know about in Japan whether you could ever get a manual, but um. no, I, I don't. I don't think it was ever officially offered with a manual. Subaru people, let us know. Um, yeah, I could be, <laughs> you know I know in the U.S. you could never get a here's, manual. Here's another. Here's another plea for uh, for enthusiasts. I want to hear your SVX story. Oh, because, if you have one, yeah, please because totally share it. Straight up, every time I've looked at an SVX that was for sale, it always had some like weird kind of story. Uh, I bought this to uh, to go with another one, and I was gonna swap this part from here, and it's like it's a, it's almost like the Corvair of Japanese cars. Nobody has one SVX. You either have <laughs> you either have none or or you have two or maybe three, but nobody has just one. And there's always every time I've looked at one, there's always been an interesting story behind it. So oh look at that cutaway. Yeah. Is that is that a Kimball? Is that a Kimball? I cutaway? don't know. It, I it, 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 it kind of looks like it. It kind of looks like a Kimball. We should do an episode all on Kimball cutaways. Yeah. I was I was I did that series for a little while. Actually, that, that's kind of how I got started at Motor One. Uh, David Kimball's cutaway. David Kimball is probably the greatest automotive cutaway artist of all time. He's been doing it for decades. Um, I had a chance to talk with him uh, a couple of years ago. Um, I mean, he still does it old school with like line drawings and paints and airbrushes, and he's still doing it today. And um, the detail in his cutaways are just fantastic. And I, I actually I have one of his books. I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna look in that book after we're done recording to see if it's in there because I want to take a good look at that. Yeah, one last SVX picture and then we'll kind of wrap things up. That would I mean that would be in case in case people haven't figured out this this I would love this to be a collaboration with Toyota and Subaru. Yeah. Um. To to bring back an, a new SVX coupe. Um. What would be a sporty Toyota coupe that they could call it? I mean. Is the RC getting old enough that you could rep- have a you know new Lexus RC? Uh, if you're just looking at coupes, I mean, don't get me started on that rumor that the Celica is coming back because that's oh my god, Bruce, you just hit it, you just hit it, exclusive right here, April fifth. The big announcement is going to be a Toyota Celica and a Subaru SVX. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, it's 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 1992 all over again. But where's my flannel and my grunge? Uh, something you just said reminded me of something that as we're winding down here, I wanted to mention to people, we have discussed doing a live stream of weird and funny press images. Cause it's something you and I both have a real passion for that. We just love these 60s, 70s, 80s, even into the nineties press photos that are just absurd. <laughs> and the thing is, if it's just you and me or you, me and the guest laughing at them, it's one thing. If we had, you know, an audience either suggesting them to us or we show people and like getting responses, it's something that could be fun. And it's something we've discussed, but it's not something we're sure that people would actually enjoy. So 
And that, that's another thing. Podcast at motor one.com. If you would want to sit down with us, you know, we'd figure out sometime some evening, um, invite a bunch of people. We, we'd have a, you know, a, a chat going on and just talk to people about the weird press images that are out there. And there are some fantastic ones. If you're interested in that, let us know. I'd be curious. Uh, it's something we've kicked around, but we're not sure whether there's an audience for. So let us know. Yeah, let us know on that podcast or motor1.com, especially from the 60s and 70s. I think those are some of the weirdest of them all. Just like like just like the really bizarre random stuff about like a car parked in a field next to an airplane where they're then sitting there having a little drink of champagne with kids in the background and like artillery in the distance, you know, but just weird stuff it could be a lot of fun it could be a lot of fun bruce um wait 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 no you started oh, me on this oh, and no. we gotta do it I, oh there's... no i i think i know the photo you're gonna you're gonna pull up while you're pulling that up i'll tell people if you want to catch either bruce or me we're on social media you can follow me on twitter at ch writing c h w r i t i n g bruce your what's your twitter handle uh chris bruce 1985 See, that makes sense because that's your name. Yeah. And then my birth date. So but mine, mine is, I have to explain to everybody, but yeah. Okay. Hey, catch us on Twitter. You know, we post occasionally, but when we, we're not the type of people that like, Hey, I look what I'm having for dinner. I mean, we post, we post good stuff. We post good so, stuff. So follow us. You mentioned just car weirdly in a field and we were talking Subarus and it made Oh, look at that. Best. This is the Subaru XT specifically the turbo model. It's, I assume the son showing it to his dad, but they're on a farm and they're both dressed in. Well, the dad's dressed in overalls. The son seems to be doing the Canadian tuxedo of denim jeans and denim shirt. And I don't know why I love this image. It's just like I, I just imagine somewhere in the American heartland in 1980. What would this be for 1984, 1986? of showing up on a farm with a Subaru XT turbo and your dad being just like, it looks so, oh, of, what the hell did you just bring home? You it looks so, I mean, it's a cool image, but it's just like one of those fish out of water things. Yeah. I, I can tell you right now, dad drives probably a 1978 Dodge Ram. Okay. Pro probably a three quarter ton. Okay. And, and if he's still alive today, he still has it. That that's the thing. It that's that's what that picture. That's what I get out of that picture. He drives. He drives a Ram. Nothing wrong with that. Not a bit. And he's and and he's looking at his son, who probably just came back from some Ivy League school somewhere. Uh, no, but he's got the denim jeans and the denim shirt. He did not come from an Ivy League school. It's, he, he had he had to put those on before he arrived back home. Because he doesn't want his dad to know what he actually does for a living. All right. I'm sorry. Just to show people what you would get if we did this press image show, I need to share my favorite press image ever because it looks like a prog rock album cover. Yes. I love it so much. This is an image of the Matra Simca Rancho. There are... So to describe people that aren't looking at, it is a very weird looking European SUV of the late 1970s slash 80s. Um, it's green. It's got big uh, headlights. But the weird thing about it is there's a guy with like giant hair and a mustache who kind of looks like Prince. If Prince was tall, holding a double barrel shotgun. Now, now see, it, weed. It, in that image, he kind of since you said prog rock. He kind of looks like maybe an, an early 70s version of Nick Mason. Pink okay. Floyd. Yeah, sure. Sure. Yeah. And then there's like this very model looking guy on the left also with a gun. And then there's just a lady who kind of reminds me of oh, her name's escaping me. The actress from uh, Annie Hall, who's mm. wearing a tweed jacket and who has, for whatever reason, she has her pants rolled up to the height of her boots. I, I don't know why she didn't either tuck them into the boots or put them over the boots, but that, that, that's the style of the boot. It was time. the style. I, I it, mean, it, it, it was the style. Yeah. It, it, this is just more one of my favorite press images ever. So more importantly, Bruce, yeah. what are they looking at? They are clearly looking. Are looking in different directions. They are clearly looking at something. The hatch is open. 
the uh, the passenger door is open. Yeah. We we have Nick Mason or Prince standing there with the gun. Um, we have a, a well, fairly large dog. Too. The the other guy's got a gun. The only is one he, not is he armed pulling is it out or putting it away. Ah, uh, I got nothing. See, we have to know what they're looking at. We have to spin that around. But no, look at them. They're all looking. The I, lady's I think- looking up. The guy's looking down. And guy on the left is looking off camera somewhere. So no one is looking at the same thing. The dog is the only thing looking at the camera. I think this is some kind of special forces group, and they're all trying to spot snipers yeah. before they before they head into this club to uh, to get some bootlegged. So, okay. Some, some bo- okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm off. No, I'm no, off no. The real I just time. had this is we got this is a uh, preview. This, this is a preview of what the live show could be like. Yeah. So if this little bit of vamping is what you would like, let us know because I could seriously. I could do this for an hour and there's a lot of press photos. I like there's that one of the Corvair with the plane that, you know, like there's just so many. Um, So yeah, but everyone, thanks for listening to us. Thanks for dealing with me ranting about Volkswagen. And then it wasn't just you. It was, it was you and it was me. It was the entire automotive journalist community. And, and judging by the, the comments we see on Volkswagen social media accounts, it's a lot of it's a lot of Volkswagen fans too. So yeah, be a good example of what not to do for April Fools. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, I hope everyone has a very good week as usual. Good afternoon, good evening, or good night, depending on when you're listening to this show. We always appreciate you. And as always, podcast at motor one.com. If you want to send us angry emails, share your fun car that you're working on, have a cool press image, just whatever. So thank you very much. Bye bye. Bye.